Good evening and welcome to Face to Face. Uh, today we are hosting a special guest, a citizen of the United States of America, but a Mongolian at heart, Ms. Sess Kerry, a, an author, a book writer, a filmmaker, an energy healer, and as I said, a Mongolian. Welcome to Face to Face. Thank you. Thank you. I like to think of myself as a Mongolian at heart. Uh, it it's is lovely. a great pleasure to host you on uh, Face to Face tonight. And uh, would you please tell us your story of becoming a Mongolian? Yes, How did it start? Of becoming a Mongolian. <laughs> well, maybe it started in another life. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. It, in 1994, I came as one of the first tourists after the revolution. Mm -hmm. And um, I just... That was before you had this new airport, mm -hmm. and I walked down the steps off the plane and put my feet on the ground, and I felt something. Mm -hmm. The energy of the ground was just felt like it was powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, my whole time here felt like that. And then I met this person, Dr. Boltsaihin, who is a traditional Mongolian medicine teacher. Mm -hmm. And my heart started beating so hard. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, would you take an American disciple? I don't even use that word, disciple. But he said yes. Mm -hmm. And so in 1995, I came back and trained in traditional Mongolian medicine. Mm -hmm. You are an energy healer. Yes, oh. and a nurse. Yeah. yeah, and what does energy healing mean? And you also have a non-governmental organization. You've established one yes. to train students in energy healing. Right? Yes. Well, <clears throat> I have a school to train students called Life Energy Healing School. Uh, and then I have a non-government uh, organization right. called Nomadicare, which is all about creating sustainability through health care mm -hmm. and cultural survival mm -hmm. for the nomadic herders of Mongolia. Mm -hmm. The, and what energy healing is, is um, how I could describe it, is we have positive energy and negative energy. Mm -hmm. And um, when my, my teacher, Dr. Bolsaihan, gave me some words to explain it, he said, if, you're have, if you have positive ions in your hands mm -hmm. and disease has negative ions, and mm -hmm. if you put your hand over the diseased area of mm -hmm. someone, mm -hmm. it will neutralize it so mm -hmm. it will heal. Mm -hmm. And very often I've found that our energy field or aura has the disease or a problem before our body has it. Mm -hmm. So that if you work in the energy field, that's the way I work, um, then and clear it. It's almost like static in a, on a radio. Mm -hmm. there, there's static. Then if you clear it so it's clear and keep yourself healthy mm -hmm. that in that way, then your body is going to be healthy too. Mm -hmm. Right. And then about nomadic care, yes. name uh, already suggests that you do have something to do with the nomads yes. of Mongolia. Yes, exactly. Well, after falling in love with Mongolia, mm -hmm. I also fell in love with your traditional culture. Mm -hmm. And I first went to the Gobi, mm -hmm. and I learned, um, be because I wanted to make a movie. Mm -hmm. I, well, it started that I worked with UNDP for mm -hmm. A, a, as a short-term health education consultant. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the women in the Gobi, the people in the Gobi, live with five liters of water a day for washing, cleaning their clothes, mm -hmm. drinking, everything, everything, mm -hmm. five liters. And I just couldn't imagine how that could happen. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make a film. Mm -hmm. My heart told me to make a film. Mm -hmm to show the world how this can be done because mm -hmm. there's so much extravagance and wasting of resources, mm -hmm. especially in the United States mm -hmm. and Western countries. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the Gobi and I made this movie, um, Gobi Women's Song, mm -hmm. and um, it, in 2001 and interviewed nomadic herders and really loved the women and actually there's a birth on it. And mm -hmm. so just mm -hmm. learning about healthcare, a barech, you know, and just, learned about healthcare and learned about the women and the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed with it. Mm -hmm. I guess I could tell a little story going back that in America in the 60s, we had, a, we had the hippies. I don't mm -hmm. know if you heard yes, about the hippies. Yes, yes. But I was sort of a back to the earth hippie. I <laughs> moved to the countryside and I didn't have electricity and telephone and running water. Mm -hmm. But there was no tradition so I really didn't know how to manage all that. Mm -hmm. We did it, but we had to figure it all out. 
And I was so excited to come here and find out that people are still holding that tradition from mm -hmm. thousands of years and they know how to live simply. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's so important for the world to know about. Especially at this time. Yes, especially at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. especially. Everybody needs to know. And when they watch the movie, when Westerners watch the movie, they mm -hmm. all say, aren't they happy? And I think it's shocking to them that, they could, that nomadic herders could mm -hmm. be happy without all the material possessions mm -hmm. that Americans and modern and people have. And hmm? your answer is to that question? They're happy sometimes, they're happy. just like regular people. Yeah, they are <laughs> but happy. But they are because, happy yeah. because they live so close to the earth and they're animals and they want happiness for their children and mm -hmm. they're, that's what their life is about. So that's where you've become a Gobi Mongolian, partly Mongolian. Yes. And then life threat tagged, took you to another part of Mongolia, yes. to yes. Hupskut, to Tsatins, Well, which is an amazing story also. Yeah. Well, when I came in 1994 and went to the National Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. I saw this little tiny picture of a shaman on a reindeer mm -hmm. in front of a norts or tipi. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I, I want to go there. Mm -hmm. I want to go there. I want to see those people. Mm -hmm. But I also said, I'm not going to be a tourist. Mm -hmm. So I waited. And then in 2003, mm -hmm. there was a group of um, a meeting for Mongolian researchers at the mm -hmm. Smithsonian Institute in mm -hmm. Washington, mm -hmm. which I went to. And Dan Plumley from the Totem Project talked about working with the reindeer herders. Mm -hmm. And um, they call themselves Dukha. A Mongolian word is satan, mm -hmm. but they call themselves dukha reindeer herders. Mm -hmm. And Dan invited me to go up and, and uh, assess their health care. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to do it. Mm -hmm. So the first year we went in, in October. It was very, very cold, mm -hmm. sleeping in the orts. And we went by car because it was frozen. Mm -hmm. But I fell in love with those people so much. They're, they were just so wonderful at sharing their lives and they I, I just felt an immediate connection with mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and I wanted to go back so badly mm -hmm. I think I was um, 58 years old and I had to learn how to ride a horse to wow. go mm -hmm. and it's been a really challenging thing for me to ride the horse up there because the terrain is very difficult mm -hmm. but every year I go back and I've been I assessed uh, what they needed mm -hmm. I found out they didn't have access to vitamin C Mm -hmm. And everyone needs 90 milligrams of vitamin C every day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can get scurvy, bleeding gums. Mm -hmm. And um, so every year I've been taking uh, a year's worth of vitamin C mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the reindeer herders since 2003. Well, it isn't that easy to go up to Mongolia. Uh, up to, it isn't easy to get to Mongolia, but then it isn't easy to get to the taiga either. Mm -hmm. Because first you, you drive over some of the worst roads in Mongolia. I've had all kinds of experience of, and of travel, and the mud, I, I know the number for, n name for mud, shower. <laughs> I know that word so well. Uh -huh. Sometimes the mud is up to the knees uh -huh. of the horses, you mm -hmm. know, it's just really challenging mm -hmm. and scary. Mm -hmm. One time uh, in 2004, I broke my foot in mm -hmm. Ulaanbaatar. Mm -hmm. And then I still had to ride the horse up to the taiga. It was my first time, eight and a half hours wow. of riding. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really, I thought I was going to die every <laughs> minute, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And the thing that drove me to go was I knew that um, Suyen, the hundred year old shaman, was still alive and that I could meet her if I finished. Hundred that year old shaman. Mm -hmm. Hundred year old shaman. So I got to the West Taiga, and there she was, Soyen, a very small woman, probably this big, mm -hmm. you know, and just amazing to meet her. I mean, I just felt so happy and grateful that I got to meet her. Mm -hmm. And then I met her daughter and um, Gosta and many of the shamans, and I interviewed them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for my next movie. Mm -hmm. And still, though, they didn't really offer to give me show me a ceremony. In 2006, mm -hmm. Gonzarg, um, this wonderful man, said, maybe I'll do a ceremony for you. Wow. And so I love this. I remember it so well, and it's in my book. But 
he came over, he is so small, and he had this hat of, uh, knit hat on. He looked like an elf to me. <laughs> and he, he was riding a reindeer, uh -huh. and he brought a horse, because I'm so not balanced very well, especially then. Uh -huh. And so he led my horse with his reindeer uh -huh. up to his settlement. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then I got to stay there. And then one night they said, okay, this night we're having a ceremony and we're inviting you. Uh -huh. So during the day, the women were uh, sewing the drum skin mm -hmm. onto the drum. Mm -hmm. And then they... It, it was wet, and then they brought it outside, and they stood it in the sun to dry mm -hmm. it off. And then when we went to, then they were making bread during the evening. They mm -hmm. didn't usually do that. Mm -hmm. So we went into Gonzarg's orts, or tipi, and um, they were drying the drum by swirling it over the fire. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they took his del off mm -hmm. and put his shaman costume on mm -hmm. and then he started um beating the drum and because i'm familiar with the spirit world i could tell when the when the angats or the ancestors came in and he was uh beating you know strongly and mm -hmm. um lots of incense juniper incense arts and it was very I, I was just so excited to do it. it. It was like three or four hours. It started, you know, in the taiga, it gets dark at about 1130 at night in the summer mm -hmm. at this time of year. And so it started about 12 o'clock. That late? Mm-hmm. Wow. It started about 12 o'clock midnight, mm -hmm. and it went till about three in the morning mm -hmm. of just... And your peop people are born with this uh, skill or merit, with this quality? Boy, or I'm working on that in my movie because I'm just trying to figure out uh -huh. what people have to say about it. Because, um, and but I still haven't figured out. Uh, I had um, one of your teachers at the National University who teaches lectures on shamanism tell me the other day that people are marked, uh, mm -hmm. branded, mm -hmm. when they're to become shamans before they're born. Now, mm -hmm. the way I would say that in Western thinking is. We come in to do something. Mm -hmm. We come into this life with for a certain mission. reason. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. with our own mission. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's to be a healer, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the way it all connects for me is that I learn to listen mm -hmm. to my heart or the spirit. And then it told me to go to Mongolia. It mm -hmm. told me to keep working with Mongolia. It Thank gave you. me the, the energy to keep going. Even though I'm 68 years old, And normal people should not be riding in the taiga <laughs> on reindeer yes, sir, and sleeping yeah, on the yes. ground. <laughs> But I still have the energy because that's Wonderful. my mission. Thank you. That's, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Sas, you know, it is a shame for a Mongolian to be asking a foreigner about the lifestyle, about the quality of lives of my compatriots, of uh, my fellow countrymen living in another part of the country. It is a shame. I True. I do admit this. But... Uh, you've written a book, Reindeer yes. in My Heart, yes. and it tells uh, stories, numerous stories about the joys, the happiness, the hopes, dreams of those people. Yeah. And I want more and more, not only foreign people, but the Mongolians themselves know about them. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I've, oh, I've found it really rewarding to take a young assistants, Mongolian assistants mm -hmm. with me and camera people. Mm -hmm. And they have also held them in their hearts. And mm -hmm. it's been, I think I've educated a number of young Mongolians by mm -hmm. helping them go up and meet this ethnic group and see how their, their mm -hmm. lives are. Mm -hmm. And tell us more about their lives, please. About their lives? Yes. When I think about the women's lives, They go to the river, they get the water in pails. They walk a long distance over bumpy ground to take it back to their orts. They chop wood, they feed the fire, they put the water in the pan, and they heat it and make tea, and they make bread and cook it on the stove. Mm -hmm. They work all the time. 
you know, they milk the reindeer morning and, and night and maybe in between. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they work so hard. Well, in the Gobi, the women work really hard, too, because mm -hmm. they're all in charge of the milk and the, all the milk products and, and the children and the inside of the gear or the orts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's an amazing um, women's life, who I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar with the women than the men, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And up in the taiga, they, it's minus 50 degrees in the winter. They're living in, with canvas around them. Mm -hmm. I was there one time, it snowed this much. It was mm -hmm. July 8th. In, in summer, mm -hmm. yeah and had to open the art store in the morning, mm -hmm. and it was very heavy because it had so much snow on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, in cold weather and w hot weather, riding reindeer, mm -hmm. um, taking care of the babies, taking care of the mothers, and, the, mm -hmm. and riding the, the males, and just huge amount of work. And then moving. Mm -hmm. you know, at least four times a year. Mm -hmm. This is a big community, well, a mid-sized community, still a part of Mongolian people, and what opportunities of, uh, for, like, say, development or prosperity do they, p do they have there, and what uh, opportunities they miss? Because I heard that these people do not usually do not want to become sedentaries. They want to uh, maintain the, this very um, wonderful lifestyle. Yes. But again, there are challenges yes. like employment, like yes. health care, like education. Right. So, and also I recall the story.